Well, if, if, you, uh, if you agree, we will start. A bit late, but just a bit late. Um, as you know, there's a, well, my name is Sonia Farré. Do you need me? In fact, the microphone is because we are recording it, but it is supposed not to be used, used in, a, in this kind of classes. Um, well, I, as I was saying, my name is Sonia Farré. I'm just going to moderate the debate and to introduce the workshop and the speakers. So, as I was saying, the, there is a growing tendency for remunicipalization, and this does not arise uh, as a whim or as a, or as a new fact, but it's a response to the failure of decades of privatization and public services. Uh, privatizations are possible because of the connivance act and action of the public state's power. After decades, we can affirm that the behavior and performance of private companies in the provision of these services have been far from the, from the promises of efficiency, innovation, and dynamism that justified their presence. Remunicipalization is presented as a way of recovering the meaning of what's public, not in a classic sense, but as a new paradigm with, with an important component of transparency, participation, and citizen control. In other words, public management by itself is not a warranty of anything, it's the democratic radicalization of what's public that allows to manage services thinking in the common good. Okay? There, are, there is this concept that are new, like public cooperative or public communities, um, and they broke with the classic binary of public and private framework, with, which are the same like states and and enterprises. And this is all overwhelmed by the incorporation of a third actor that it's very important in this, in this workshop, that it's organized citizenship. As you may know, we find a lot of a strong resistance on the part of those who have enjoyed the privilege of managing these services in a private way. Today in the Spanish state, there are journeys, publications, associations and foundations that are created statements and an endless of a, amount of activity around the resistance to remunicipalization. And this is sponsored by the big multinational companies who see their second business in danger. They seek to impact on the public opinions to try to gain legitimacy since, for instance, there's this uh, recent survey that has been published in, the, in a widespread Spanish press that concluded that the 80% of population was in favor of public management of services such as water, health, or the, manage the management of waste. So we must not forget this alliance between them, and we can see it here in the state, especially in their efforts to create new legislative frameworks that put uh, more obstacles to remunicipalization and on different ways of pressures that they, ex that they exert to prevent them. So, in short, today is much easier to privatize than to remunicipalize, which is nonsense if we take into account that the legal framework should be protecting the general interest, interest and the public services. To end and to start with the workshop, we want to use this, uh, this occasion to thank Olivier and Satoko from the Transnational Institute for their support in giving ideas and, and experiences for this workshop. And we will start talking about real experiences from the concrete and the daily practices with uh, three speakers. We must excuse Car um, Carmin Piscopo from Naples because he finally cannot be here, but we can have three variety optics from Olivier Petitjean, who is from the Observatory on Multinationals, also Claire Rumet, from the, who is director of Energy Cities, and Miriam Planas from I West Vida, which is translated like Water is Life, who will speak for 20 minutes each. Okay, so if, if, you, uh, if you want, we can start. And just let me remember you that although you were registered, maybe there will be people who is here but was not supposed to be here. We are not going to expel you, just to ask each of you later to write your email in a, in a sheet so we can share the information with all of you. Okay? 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So um, I'm a French journalist uh, working uh, for the Multinational, Observ Multinational Observatory, who is basically an investigative website so, uh, or watchdog on French transnational corporations. And I've been involved in, uh, with the Transnational Institute and uh, uh, Engineers Without Border. I don't know how to say it in Catalan, sorry. And uh, many trade unions in uh, preparing a report on remunicipalization uh, across the world and across sectors that's going to be published on the 23rd of June. And uh, what I'm going to present you today basically is a, an overview of, uh, of our findings. Um, we, two years ago, with uh, about the same partners, we published a couple of reports uh, investigating remunicipalization in the water sector. And we found that there were more than 300 cases of water remunicipalization worldwide and that it was a strong trend that was really underreported in the media and by experts and um, that uh, and still uh, at the same time international financial institutions or others were still pushing for privatization and there was a but there was an alternative and at the same time we were aware that uh, in Germany for instance there was a huge uh, remunicipalization wave so uh, about a year ago, we decided to take on the ambitious task of uh, investigating remunicipalization, as I said, across all sectors and across the world, even though we were aware that it was mostly occurring in Europe. And uh, we did that through working uh, with a range of NGOs and researchers in different countries. And trade unions were a huge help. The uh, European uh, Federation of uh, Public Service Trade Union uh, circulated a survey, and uh, about 16 members uh, of the, that union uh, came back with uh, cases. So overall, we found, and I think that's definitely a, a very incomplete list, but we found, here it says uh, 832, actually the final number will be 835. 835 numbers, cases of remunicipalization across the world. As you see, it's uh, strong in Europe, but uh, it's, it exists uh, everywhere in the world, in North America, of course, and also in, uh, in the Global South. I will talk about it in a little while. And we see, <clears throat> and we see that it also, it's also strong across sectors. So it's especially strong water remunicipalization in France. It's a big one. Energy remunicipalization in Germany is also a big one, and I think both of them account for at least half of cases, but we find, and to our surprise, because we didn't really expect it, that there is remunicipalization in uh, all the sectors, waste sector, education, and in local governments, it's a range of sectors like building, cleaning, school restaurants, etc. And in France, for instance, I was not aware at all there was a remunicipalization uh, trend going on in a transport, local transport sector. But actually, in the past 15 years, about 15, uh, even 20, uh, 20 cities or uh, local councils have remunicipalized the transport sector. Um, <clears throat> so I think there are, when you, look to, when you look at remunicipalization, there's uh, various degrees of remunicipalization. Some, uh, some local authorities will remunicipalize for purely economic reasons because they find it's cheaper. And actually, I mean, I don't think I need to convince you. I'm not going to go through uh, all the arguments against privatization and how in-house uh, service is cheaper. But there is this basic reason of uh, it being cheaper. Uh, but uh, and uh, you know not being satisfied with uh, the, the conditions in which uh, local authorities have to deal with multinational corporations and the uh, huge imbalances in information and power and legal resources that it involves. But but there's also uh, so we have one one side of the remunicipalization movement that's less political, let's say, and there's another side at the other angle where remunicipalization is really seen as a as a, a, a political uh, approach in itself. And uh, we see cities, especially in Spain or in some cities in France, that are um, seeing remunicipalization as a symbol of the, their progress the new progressive approach to local politics and are undertaking multiple remunicipalizations. So we see that in, uh, in a few cities in, uh, in Spain, including here in Barcelona. And we see that in some cities in France, like Grenoble or some others, that sometimes do it a bit under the radar. For instance, I found that a small city in the Alps called Briançon, they've undertaken like about remunicipalization and five services, never made a big fuss out of it. Uh, so we, 
my point is there's really this two sides of this municipalization movement, a bit one less political and more thinking, okay, uh, just trying to address corporate abuse, basically, and uh, a level of a saner competition, let's say, and the ones that's more strongly politicized. But we find that often in national contexts, and they are closely allied. Oh, sorry. And uh, and let's uh, sorry, get me interrupted. And a, uh, a sequence of that is remunicipalization. In a way, we find, uh, and I'm going a bit more in top, into topics that I want to cover later. Is often uh, it's, it goes beyond a bit classical uh, political cleavages. And often at local level, we find uh, we see conservative politicians and even really right-wing politicians undertaking multiple remunicipalizations. In France, we have that example in Nice, which uh, the mayor is Christian Estrosi, really a conservative guy, and he remunicipalized uh, school restaurants, transport water, and some others. And often you see uh, a sort of trans. I mean, to various degrees. I know in some countries, like perhaps Spain, it's a bit more uh, conflictual. But in some, especially in Germany, we see municipalization being less politically conflictual and a bit across the party lines. Um, so that's interesting to, um, and yeah, and for me, that means that it's one of our findings that it's often municipalization is about a reaction from the local level, and that's relevant for the purpose of this whole conference against uh, austerity policies or privatization policies that are being imposed from. European level, of course, and, and often more and more, and you have the case in Spain, and it's the same in the UK, and very soon in France, uh, from the national level. So uh, this is just a, a visual to show that uh, the municipalization trend is actually increasing over time, with ups and downs. So in different, it's, uh, the black line is the total, and you see different sectors. So I think. I'm going to go over it at the end, but I think there's a um, municipalizations inspire each other. So we see a, I don't know the term in English, but like a sort of a boule de neige, like a snowball that's getting bigger, <laughs> snowball effect. And this is to illustrate a point that has already been made. Uh, when we talk about remunicipalization, actually we talk about a variety of different legal forms, levels. And more and more, we talk about uh, not remunicipalization, strictly speaking, but municipalization, that is, creation of uh, brand new public companies. And that's the case, especially in Germany, uh, in the energy sector. But we see the same, uh, for instance, in France, we have examples in the school restaurant sector where some little towns have created municipal farms to supply their, their public uh, school restaurants. So it's, uh, we see this sort of innovation of, in uh, new public services. And of course, in the book, we also talk about the Global South, and we give some examples in India, where we have a, a state or city-wide uh, administrations that have created whole new public services. For instance, in Tamil Nadu, they've created a public canteen uh, restaurant services for poor people that's really uh, working very well, to, uh, you know, providing food for a lot of poor people. And in uh, Delhi, they've created a new health clinics public service that's provide uh, low-cost health care for the poor people of uh, Delhi. And this is just, we, we had a big debate between ourselves about whether we should talk about nationalization as, as well. <laughs> because uh, in some, uh, there are diff many different forms of uh, nationalization, and in some cases it's about uh, centralizing power. Like we say, for instance, in Hungary at the moment, you know, the central authority and central government is buying stuff, but it's just because they want to grab power. Sometimes it's just about bailing out banks and other companies. So we, tr but we still thought it might be worth uh, keeping a few nationalization cases, especially in Latin America, because in those countries, uh, essential services like energy, water, are often under the control of, uh, of national governments rather than local authorities. And we see, in, especially in Argentina, a bit in Bolivia, uh, efforts to deprivatize public services that are really about. Uh, uh, restoring public services with universal access. For instance, uh, postal services in Argentina, the, there was a private provider who is now the son of the boss, is now the president of Argentina, uh, who stopped uh, delivering mail to some remote regions because it was not profitable, so they renationalized it. And so it's really about rebuilding uh, public services for all. So now I'm going to touch uh, on a few of the issues that we, um, in the countries that we explored in our, in our book. So I'm, I'm starting with Norway because that's not a country you would think of normally as a really radical politics country, but actually uh, there's a, some really interesting stuff going on there. 
they're a bit like in Spain, uh, I mean, sorry, it's not comparable, but uh, they have a really conservative, nation, conservative national government, and two years ago they had a wave of uh, progressive coalitions uh, gaining power in all the major cities in Norway. And uh, I don't, I mean, that's all I know, I don't know much more about the <laughs> local political context. But I, what I know is that uh, they really uh, initiated a very interesting work with uh, the local, the National Trade Union of Public Services to remunicipalize services in Norway in a way that was really collaborative between uh, the workers and the local authorities, to a certain extent the citizen a bit less, but Norway is a bit of a special case. And they've remunicipalized a lot of uh, um, services in the healthcare local government sector, and while providing better conditions for worker, uh, better contracts, uh, better health and safety, etc., and they're making it cheaper. So it's, it's really interesting because uh, we see in a lot of uh, cases that uh, the workers' issue is really one of the weak points of municipalization. And that uh, some uh, national governments know very well that this is a weak point and try to instrumentalize uh, the workers' issue by turning workers against municipalization. It's been the case uh, to a certain extent in France, but now we have, uh, I think you have the problem quite uh, in Spain uh, in a very important way. Um, another issue that I will, uh, so now Germany, which is a big one with a lot of municipalization in different sectors, especially in energy. Um, one of the things we found is that actually remunicipalization is really uh, driving uh, innovative uh, public services that really take on the global challenges. Remunicipalization, in a lot of cases, not in all cases of course, but in a lot of cases, is not about local politics, it's about addressing global challenges. And we see that in the climate, uh, energy climate sector, of course, energy municipalization in Germany, but not only in Germany, in the different countries in Europe, in the US in some cases, is about uh, not only remunicipalizing, but switching to decentralized uh, renewable-based energy systems. But actually we found we see it in other sectors as well. And uh, for instance, in the waste sector, you know, we talk, now, nowadays we talk a lot about the going zero waste and uh, and a lot of uh, city councils are going zero waste, so preventing waste uh, as much as possible. And, then, and it's not possible to do that with a private provider because a private provider is uh, about uh, having large volumes and then putting them in landfills or uh, burning them. And so we see a lot of cases where cities have remunicipalized as a first step towards going zero waste because going zero waste, it means you have to work with your citizens. It's, exact, it's a completely different type of relations with, with citizens and the service and users than a, a private company can, can engage in. And we see that also in the school restaurant sector, especially in France, we have a few interesting examples where uh, cities have remunicipalized the school restaurants and uh, either have created a municipal farm, like I said, or more frequently have uh, developed partnerships with the local farmers cooperatives, or it's really about rebuilding the local economy, a local um, sourcing of food, for, uh, of uh, organic food, of course, in most cases uh, for children. And so we see that component of uh, relocalizing the economy. It's, it's, uh, it's um, pro probably clear, we'll talk about it in, uh, for the energy sector, but we see it in different sectors as well. Um, so that is France. So we have, uh, I've touched a bit upon all of this. Um, so one, Maybe I'm going to switch to Spain and talk about that. And that's Spain. Uh, so we have, a, that's a really a more recent uh, remunicipalization wave, but we hope it's going to grow bigger and bigger. And, uh, it's probably going to grow bigger and bigger in the next few years. So um, this, for me, fr France, in France we have, uh, illustrates uh, another point that's important, is that uh, remunicipalization is also about uh, building uh, better public services and especially a more democratic public services. And that's, that's a key issue, especially in Spain. We have a bit of a few experiences in France in the water sector where uh, some large cities such, such as Grenoble or Paris or Montpellier now have uh, really uh, introduced some really interesting uh, participatory mechanisms in the management of the public oper operators. And not only sitting at the board, but also creating specific places where users can actually discuss and engage with the uh, people that run the, the operator to understand what it's about in a really substantial discussion and not just rubber stamping. And I think it's important uh, in Spain, but uh, Miriam will, will talk about it in more detail, that uh, it's about uh, not only you know, reverting uh, public services to a system uh, that existed before, but creating a new generation of public services that 
uh, don't prevents the, you know, re uh, repeating the abuse of the past in terms of uh, political patronage. We know that at local level in Spain and everywhere in France as well, uh, it's a problem. And corruption, of course, corruption scandals that are big everywhere, uh, at least in the south of Europe. I'm not going to talk for the north. <laughs> Um, and Spain illustrates a bit of trend that we've seen uh, across uh, our cases is that, uh, as I've said, uh, municipalization is a local reaction against austerity and very often we see national governments really in the way of municipalization. And we see it in the UK where actually uh, the British Parliament has passed a law banning local authorities for running local bus new local bus services, so it's preventing a municipalization. In France, in the energy sector, it's, uh, I'm not going to go into that, it's quite politically complicated, but we have a few issues there. And of course, in Spain, uh, we, have, we see the central government actively uh, trying to prevent municipalization from happening in, in, in quite an incredible way. It's, uh, I mean, it's never, I've never seen it to such extent before. So. And, uh, but uh, this, uh, the pressure of uh, national governments is just, for me, another layer of, a, of a, an architecture of pressures uh, of, that prevent uh, legal, but politi uh, political, economical, of course, but also legal uh, uh, constraints that prevent the uh, cities from remunicipalizing. And in, the, um, in our work, we emphasize the, the emerging threat of uh, free trade agreements and ISDS. So we did, um, we did a lot of, uh, we, we tried to survey a bit the, the way uh, ISDS and free trade agreements was preventing remunicipalization, and we found that uh, even in Europe in the last few years, one has the impression it's, so we found about 20 cases, and you know, historically ISDS is a weapon of uh, corporations from uh, wealthy countries and strong countries against poor countries, but you, one, really, one really has the impression it's closing in on Europe. And I think, I'm curious to think if uh, Barcelona remunicipalizes its water, I'm wondering if Suez, since Agbar is a subsidiary of French multinationals, we might not see an ISDS, because I know, uh, the ISDS has been used against Spain before in the energy sector, so it's really, I think it's a big threat closing in on a, on a lot of remunicipalizations. Uh, so really that connection between the free trade, uh, refusing free trade agreements and the remunicipalization is really strong, especially since remunicipalizations, as I said, is also about rebuilding the local economy. And uh, so, yeah, I haven't gone through UK. So UK... Um, well, we've seen the result of the elections a few days ago where uh, during Jeremy Corbyn uh, campaigned uh, really on a platform of uh, rebuilding public services, including nationalization in some cases, and uh, it really talked to the people. But even uh, with that, uh, the British government still being controlled by um, uh, a government that's more uh, pro-privatization, we see local authorities uh, doing, doing things especially in the energy sector. Uh, a lot of cities have uh, created new municipal companies, both uh, to switch to uh, renewable energy, but also to address energy poverty, because it's really a big issue uh, in, the, in the UK, and they have a system where they put people that don't pay their bills on prepaid meter. So it's something that's been existing for water in the global south. I've never seen it before in, uh, in the UK. Um, and also, they have, uh, there's a, the, the country in Europe that has the longest experience with uh, different forms of uh, private public partnerships for infrastructure and a lot of services. And there's a lot of also feedback from that saying, you know, uh, because of the failure of many contracts, they had to take everything in house and it was ultimately cheaper because it, it, there was, they would note all those extra costs in legal costs or having to deal with uh, the big four, the accountant firms to design the contract, etc. So there's a lot of uh, learnings from the savings in that. So to conclude, I just want to emphasize the importance of uh, networks and uh, cities working together. We see it happening already. We see it in Catalonia. There's a, you've created a network of uh, cities for public water. In France, we, uh, when there was the remunicipalization movement uh, started, we, they also created a new structure, France au public, uh, to help uh, cities that have remunicipalized uh, to help each other. Because as I said, there are a lot of uh, difficulties uh, in the in in balance of power with corporations and uh, finding, uh, having the legal recourses, resources to, to make, make it happen. And we, networks are so important because, as I said, there's a snowball effect. And for instance, in the UK, uh, it started with Nottingham that created its uh, energy company, and then the, the city nearby created its other company on the same model, and then another one, and then they create a whole partnerships of uh, new uh, municipal energy companies. And, um, and it's, yeah, and it's important because, yeah, I mean, I can conclude here. So building networks and making all those networks come together is really 
critical to make uh, to make it happen. Uh, remunicipalization continue to happen in spite of all the, the constraints and threats that we are facing. So actually, this is a perfect um, transition because. Uh, we can try. Ahí se es verdad. No. Ah, por la cámara. Esto está bien. Sí. Pero es que no ve dónde está. Esto, ahí va ahí. La anterior. Pero tampoco es que tampoco se ve mucho más. Ok. Pues. So the only, the only thing is that you have to promise you don't sleep, huh? because otherwise, uh, that's, uh, I need to see your eyes <laughs> open. So I'm Claire Roumet from uh, Energy Cities. Energy Cities is a network of cities in energy transition. Always, it's, it's, a, it's a network that is existing for 25 years, and it always looked only at the energy system in the, in the city and always said that actually there is a lot that is possible to do at local level. So 25 years ago, it was like completely revolutionary. Today, it's completely common sense that the, everything can happen at local level in terms of energy systems or, or, or almost. This, the network is based principally in uh, Europe. We have members in all European countries. We have quite a lot of members in Eastern European countries, wow. including Ukraine or Georgia. So it goes quite th that far. But we, we are not excluding anybody to become a member. Our, um, our agenda is uh, mainly uh, the EU policies. We are based in Brussels. We are trying to look at how to make the legal framework at European level and national level the most uh, adequate for the development of local energy solutions. Uh, and for that, our agenda is based on what we call the 3D, which is not about digitalization and decarbonization of what usually NG or other big companies are explaining what is the energy transition. For us, the energy transition is about three levers of action. And it's one, it's because it's, it's very key and it, it can be transformative to democratize the energy system and democratizing any energy system or any big sector that is key to our economy, transform the economy. That's, that's what we have behind. Decentralization, because today most of, uh, and actually we usually call about a devolution. It's like there is a need of devo devolving some powers, because before it was a national energy systems. That has, that has really uh, designed the entire energy legislation, but today a uh, national energy system doesn't make any sense anymore, and divestment, because <laughs> this is all about local finance, looking at how your public budget is spent and how you can spend it much better by doing actually uh, another uh, energy uh, spending and lo looking at your energy spending and every spending you do, what it's as has an impact on climate change. So th this is a two-pillar. So remunicipalization is actually a very big trend today in EU. And what we have uh, come up is really because of the needs of the members. We had too many questions all the time by cities everywhere saying, we want to remunicipalize, but we have no clue on where to start. And so they were constantly asking us with legal examples, uh, some uh, 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 enterprise format, uh, 
governance uh, examples. So we decided to start looking at, uh, at it. Although there, it exists a lot of work, as Olivier has mentioned before, there is a lot of wor work done already on many sectors, and we wanted to see whether if we go a little bit more deeper on energy, then we would get some concrete examples that would help each other. One of the key questions they asked is also, I need to convince the other councillors. I have a kind of a very weak majority in my uh, municipal council and it's not enough. So it, to, for, for going to uh, such a radical change, I really need to get all the political arguments. And that's actually the first step. Uh, and it's not known only on remunicipalization, but it's one of the big, big ask of local authorities today. They need storytelling, they need examples, because the first thing they, 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 that is needed now is really meeting a kind of a consensus at the council, at the municipal council level. And then the how-to, which I have already um, uh, mentioned. Just to say that this, this study we have done, so here we have some uh, very summary, but it will be full on our website uh, in 10 days. It's launched in Brussels on the 20th of, uh, or 22nd of June. So you, I really encourage you to, to just go and download it. It has been done by Andreas Rüdinger, who is a, a researcher at uh, IDRI uh, in France, a, a think tank uh, in France, and with whom we are working because he has a very deep knowledge on, on this issue. So first we wanted to have a closer look to when we say remunicipalization, what does it really mean? Because everything can be remunicipalization. Then, I, as I explained, we looked at uh, what can be the driver for the change, how uh, cities are starting to decide that they want to remunicipalize, and then we, we had a closer look to the obstacles, which are currently not, not, so, not so the one that we believed it would be, uh, because the legal barriers are very, very few, but it's mainly about this change of mind, and uh, I'll, I'll finish by a strategic summary. So to start with the concept of remunicipalization, it, it comes from two angles, obviously. There is the angle of uh, uh, looking at uh, when to put the citizen at the core of the energy system, and this is more the community projects and that, are that are happening at local level, many, many, many. Today, there is an absolute boom in Europe of energy uh, cooperatives. Uh, led by citizen only, uh, with only citizen as, as a main um, finance, financial partners. Sometimes it's hybrids, and that's why it's part of our remunicipalization context, because the most interesting examples are when there, it's an, an hybrid format, where the municipalities is actually a key partner, or the region, or the, the, uh, a, mic, a number of local authorities together, which is even more interesting. So it really increased cooperation of different actors. Uh, to work and, but this is only energy production, actually. So it's, it's a kind of an easy, an easy go. You create an energy production unit, like a farm, like you were mentioning before, and, and, and that's actually quite um, easy. We also put participative governance here because there is a need and um, actually big companies also understood that needs to include citizens more into the energy uh, decision models. In energy models decision, sorry. And, and, and here we have some, we have not digged in on, in that one. We want to do another further study uh, later on because there is also very interesting new examples of including citizen on the driving seat of the energy system and not only into public companies, because that, that's one way to go, but there is other ways, and that, that's something which is very interesting. So the remunicipalization is basically the core, it's like the, the, the really the, um, the, 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 the backbone, and uh, you have then other layers that are possible that are a little bit not fitting into the the kind of a restricted remunicipalization definition, but that are also for us the same trend, which is about local energy democracy, local energy systems democracy. The, I will not come back because actually Olivier already mentioned the, the different, uh, the, the context of the remunicipalization, so that I will uh, not uh, go in depth at all in that, uh, on that slide, only to say that 
What is also very interesting in Germany on the energy side is that it goes much beyond the production because they also really looked at the greed concession, concessions and, and this is actually one for us, it's even more important than the production because the production might be, um, the, it's the easy go, but the greed is re really where there is today the power on, on the energy uh, mix. So <clears throat> maybe that one I will not also um, uh, detail it too, too much. I have just mentioned it, that there is different ways on looking at remunicipalization. You can look at the very restrictive definition, meaning in that sense that it would be only the activities at municipal level, that it will be only about services that were before municipal and that have been privatized, and uh, that you would <coughs> look at only the really restrictive sectors that are very, very only linked to the energy uh, sector. So it's, it's, a, it's only, remunicipalization can be, in a way, only a return to public ownership. But there is an open definition of remunicipalization which we need to go, and we need to also an do the analysis uh, for all those different trends, because this is where it's more hybrid, and this is where there is more, more cap um, um, potential of development, actually. The re-municipalization, very, very uh, restrictive definition. There might not be so many uh, development potential, but in the open definition, there is much more. And here it goes into uh, looking at energy not in isolated way from waste, for example, or from water, and making, uh, having a look if you can have a municipal company that does everything together because it makes sense or not. So it's to, to have a closer look to others. Now, going back to why you do the remunicipalization uh, in, in an extended, open definition way. As Olivier mentioned, what was very interesting also in the findings uh, is, is the same, is, is the fact that it's not always political in a sense of, uh, it's, it's not always against the privatization, uh, the, the, the previous privatization. It goes much beyond that. Th this is a clear, uh, a clear driver because it's often because uh, the private management is, is really not um, acceptable. So that, that's a, obviously a, a first step. But uh, it's really also about getting back the power to on, on the decision on the network which is on your territory. Because the energy network in a territory, it's really a tool for the development of the local economy. You can, you can make sure that the, the pipes are, are going in the right way, that they can be uh, uh, actually uh, speaking to each other. Uh, so it, it, it looks very technical, but it's a, key pot it's a key tool for the development of the local economy. Also, obviously, a lot of uh, local authorities looked at uh, how much they do spend on energy by months, by year. For, for as a municipality, but also on the territory. And like, for example, in Birmingham, the region, they have noticed that they spend one billion euro, or pound in, in that case, one billion pound a year that is going out of their territory for energy bills. So it's, it's East Midlands region. It's not that big, but still it's bigger. It's one, but it's one billion a year. So they are in the process of creating also a, a public company a municipal company of energy, but for them it's almost, I would say, only about uh, uh, um, buying energy, a cheaper energy, and trying to, buy, to uh, increase local production so that at least this one billion euro that is going outside is lower. So that, that's their, the main, uh, one of the main key drivers with energy poverty, as Olivier mentioned too, because uh, in UK almost all uh, remunicipalization projects are actually uh, always are pitched as a way to fight energy poverty. The, the reconnecting with local stakeholders and citizens is something that we see in some countries, but not in all. Uh, and uh, that's one of the key uh, questions. And the transversal approaches and synergies is something that is currently only emerging. The fact that you can try to find a way to have, a, when you have the data of energy, you can do many, many other things on, on energy efficiency and making sure you understand that, for example, if as a public authority you have the management of the energy data, you can see that there is waste, heat in one company and that 
just next there is a school that can just be heated by the waste heated for that, from that company and that you don't need anything. You don't need solar panel, you don't need anything. You just need to connect those two. And this you can only do when you have a clear landscape uh, map, mapping uh, of, you, of the, what we call the, the treasure map of energy at local level. However, all this, there is a really, really, really uh, important importance of the specific national factors. And this is something we, we want to also, I mean, that was in a way a surprise because we have this impression of a very uh, global trend, and it's true, but it's very, very different in each country, and it's very depend, depending on the local context. For example, Valencia, here in Spain, they really want to do their energy company, but they cannot because of the law that is uh, preventing them to do any new public company. It, it's, it's, make, it's making sense. There is no reason why. Only one law saying that. So in, in Barcelona, as I understood, you can only do because you already had a company that you can basically plug an energy um, uh, kind of a mission, but, but it's like a little bit a trick because it was not supposed to be so, but okay, you can trick it and nobody can say anything. But th this, is a, a, a full, uh, this is a full legal barrier. It's very local uh, dependent, and in that case, it's a complete nonsense. Um, I'm already needed to go much faster because otherwise you will get nothing. <laughs> Uh, this one then I will skip because these are examples. The, what was the meaning? Increase influence or local. Yeah. The, well, the, the one before is actually, what, the main point of it is to say that um, what is very interesting also in the remunicipalization re re trends is that it helps each territory to invent its own kind of uh, target. It's its, uh, its its own vision. So in France, we have one region that is saying that they will be the first one with, with positive energy, or in Stuttgart, at a city level, then they created the Stadtwerke, uh, a specific Stadtwerke in 2011. Um, but the, the Stadtwerke, as, as a one mission, the objective of being a city zero emission by 2050. So it's, it's a, the tool, it's not about only energy production, it, as you were also saying uh, before, the tool has been created, the Stadtwerke, so the energy company has been created for a climate agenda. And the mission is to be zero emission. The mission is not to provide electricity, is not to provide uh, gas. This is a kind of a, the, the, the objective is, is very political. So I think this is also extremely interesting to, to see, to think when you create an, an energy company, a municipal company or a, an hybrid company, what is your core objective? The second motive is the local added value. And here it's a, it's a very good example uh, in North Essen of uh, a, um, a municipality a German, in Germany that uh, wanted to uh, build seven, they w wanted to have seven windmill uh, on their territory because they, they, they wanted to have this energy. And then they have done a study on how much it will, the money will be back onto their, in their territory in the lifetime of the seven windmills. So the, the lifetime is more than 25 years. And how much will be uh, actually uh, so how much you can keep if you have this as a municipal company or if you have this as a private company operating on your territory. And it's absolutely striking that the figures is they are million euros on the lifetime. So seven million are coming back on the territory if you find a private operator, a model extern. And it's more than, uh, it's almost uh, 60 if you put it, if you have a, a um, a cooperative uh, or in municipal co company so that you, you are really driving your project on uh, the um, local uh, citizen, then you, you get back much more on your territory. So this is too much. Uh, so th this is something that we often not 
think about in the remunicipalization, and I think it's very important, it's another mot motivation for the municipalization, is the fact that you can have a much closer look at this integrated approach on energy, combine heat and power, heating and cooling uh, strategy uh, and, and, and uh, provision with the electricity, the biogas, with the, the bus transport, and you can also pool um, the, the, the different um, municipal uh, need that you have. So that, I think it's, it's very interesting. So now I'll go directly to the conclusion because I think I'm... Um, the, the regulatory obstacle, actually, I basically already looked at it uh, by the, with the example of Valencia, which is one of the best. I'm going there, and I will finish there, uh, to uh, have a closer look to actually to what you need to, be to look at in a closer when you um, uh, want to do a new local company in that case. So the strength for, your, for the municipality is basically that uh, it connects citizen and the local area and this is almost one of the first uh, reasons why that it's coming uh, at first when people uh, say that they want to do the remunicipalization. But it's also to build trust and to have more legitimacy of your public action. So the legitimacy is a very, very strong point. It, it gives uh, the, some uh, very strong synergies between the different sectors at local level, and that's all, obviously that really increases the efficiency of, the, of, the, of your local energy metabolism, much more than anything else. I think that this potential of, of, of all the synergies between the different actors that can act at local level on the energy system, you can really get a lot of uh, um, uh, spare, um, a, a lot of savings there. Of course, the, the weaknesses is that, and that's where we are now, is that uh, local authorities, they do believe that they don't have the indoor, the in the in-house technical and the legal economic skills to deliver that project. So it's a, it's a very heavy project. You, re, you need to be very motivated to start with. But also that when you are looking at local le level, then you limit the scale effect. And that's why in the slides before, we also have some very interesting examples of companies that are owned by local authorities, but that are acting in four different countries. Because what they do is provide advice to local authorities. It's the, the, the example is called Trianel, and it was in a slide before. As external factors, uh, there is a number of um, uh, opportunities, obviously, that I, I don't need to really go back onto it, but the, the, the threats is uh, the number of legal constraints, because uh, it's not easy to build on your lo local although it's, al it's almost, uh, apart from the example of Valencia and, and Spain, it's never uh, impossible, at least in the EU, to create your own municipal company. It's really a specific case in, 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 in Spain, but in most of the cases it's not. And then there is a lot of um, problems, however, on bundling, unbundling. So this is all the electricity market and the energy market de design directives in EU are quite restrictive for local actors to enter. And uh, they definitely are designed for very big uh, actors. And they, they, the idea is that there is six big actors in all EU. And then because of that, it would be super efficient. Uh, so it, the, the, the complexity of the, of the legal framework is, is really uh, very big. Voilà. I, will start there. I will stop there. I think I have really, um, yeah, just to say that there is no silver bullet at all. But you are very, very local dependent uh, the, I mean, the, the, it's very local context dependent, the drivers and the solutions, so you need to really uh, dig in forward, but, um, but it's always possible, except in the case of, I think even in Valencia you can maybe uh, twist, twist the arm of the housing company or I don't know, so you have to find a way. Okay, thank you very much.
Hello. Um, my name is Miriam Planas. I work in Engineering Without Borders, Engineering Without Borders, um, an association be which basically makes international development cooperation, but now also, from some years ago, we work also in the north, bringing all the knowledge we've been uh, accumulating during years in working with the south, also here. <laughs> and uh, also I am actively involved in IOS Vida, Water is Life platform, which is a citizen platform formed by more than 50 organizations here in Catalonia, uh, which is working toward public and democratic and non-commercial water management and also to maintain and improve uh, the quality of all types of water ecosystems. Um, first of all, uh, let me explain you a little bit of the Catalan context in regarding water, public and private water. We call it uh, the Catalan anomaly because uh, meanwhile uh, in the world you have 90% of public water in Europe, it decreases until 80%. In Spain, we see as it decreases until 50%. But in Catalonia, we have less than 20% of public water and more than 80% of private. So this is the scenario uh, we have and that we found, find, found out when we started working with uh, IOS Vida platform. So what we did, uh, first of all, was to decide to send letters to all municipalities in Catalonia to see what was happening, no? to, to draw what is the scenario and what is what we have here. So we ask four questions. Uh, which type of um, water management do you have, public or private? Which is the company um, doing the water, ser serving the, the water? When does the concession end, if it's private? And how many cuts of water Mm, does your municipality have, no? Uh, how many people uh, get uh, the, the water cut if they don't pay, no? For economical uh, motives. And this is the result of that uh, letters with the, with the answers and some additional data, we build the, the maps of water in Catalonia, no? And as we can see in the maps, and the map on, of the right, you it seems like we have more or less 50% and 50% of public and private, no? In blue, public, in red, private. But when we, when we look at it uh, in terms of population, then the, the, the public decreases, no? It, it disappears almost. And what we have is the, the accumulation of the big companies and big cities where they can recover the, the, their investments. So we have 84% um, of population served by private operators. And who are these private operators? Then we uh, draw the map of the, of the private operators. On the left, all the private companies. But on the right, we have the corporation map. So when we don't look at the names of the companies, but we look to the corporation group, we found out there was only two corporations. And one of, one of them, I was Barcelona, Akbar, uh, which belongs to Suez. Mm, provides 90% of the private water served in Catalonia. So it's serving 74% of the population, one, only one company, which is the one uh, also based in Barcelona. And the other one is Aqualia, which is a filial from uh, a, a building uh, company in, from Spain. And the third map, which maybe is the more, <laughs> the more sad and the more shocking, is the map of the cuts of water. The answer of the municipalities when we asked uh, for how many cuts do they have was this one. And in gray is the municipalities who didn't know how many cuts of water were done in their, in their municipalities. So we didn't have the data of that. And they uh, to tell us to ask the private companies for that information because they didn't know, no? Yeah. That gave us an idea of the lack of regulation and the <clears throat> that the municipalities had regarding water. They had externalized it. It's been private for so many years. In main, mainly, in, in many of the cities, 
uh, it has been always private, no? Because it has never been remunicipalized. So the municipalities don't know anything about their, their management. Luckily, this is a scenario. This is back in 2014, but now in Catalonia there are no cuts of water. <laughs> But it's not because of the municipalities and the regulation, it's because a civil society was organized and a law was passed in the Catalan Parliament forbidding water and energy cuts. In the case of water, uh, there are no cuts anymore. In the case of energy, it's not working so well. <laughs> so, uh, with this scenario, the, there is a window of opportunity now, no? Because what we, always, we, what we also saw with these letters was that many of the contracts were ending during the next years, no? In the next 10 years, from 2015 to 2025, more than one concession contracts are ending, and more than 100 concession contracts are ending in Catalonia, which represents a, a very interesting window of opportunity. In 2010, the first remunicipalization was made here, it was Figaro, and from 2010 till, nine, till now, we have 15 remunicipalizations so far. Um, the biggest until now is Montornés with uh, 16,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, but we have uh, different political colors, no? as they were saying, remunicipalization also here in Spain, although it's not our purpose, it's um, it has very different, different uh, political colors. We have conservative uh, municipalities who have decided to remunicipalize, and also uh, the new, the new uh, uh, citizenship uh, coalitions are deciding and are pushing for that. But we are uh, defending this remunicipalization that Olivier was saying, no, with uh, participation uh, to, to implement this social control, not only to change, to swap to public management, because that doesn't guarantee uh, a change in the, in the water management. I've, um, I've uh, put here a case from Arendt Zemun to talk uh, about something concrete. No? This was not the first one, but the second one done in Catalonia with uh, almost 9,000 inhabitants. It was privatized in 1999, and it's also from Sorea Akbar, so it can give us a, an, an insight on what is the, the strategy of the company, how does it, um, uh, what, what's its behavior, no? Because in Barcelona it's the same company, and most of the remunicipalizations that we hope are coming the next years are going to face the, the same the same strategy. So what we found in that case, what we had was a lack of regulation from the city council. They didn't know anything about the water service. Uh, a lack of transparency from this private company who didn't provide the necessary data data and. Also, they give some uh, false data to the city council during the remunicipalization because they said that the efficiency was 75% as the contract said it should be, but once it was public, they discovered the real efficiency was 57% of the network. Uh, it makes it, it makes it also very difficult to remunicipalize when you have a corporation architecture which works not locally but works uh, regionally. So you don't know the, the municipal the, the municipal council don't know how many workers does the does the company really have. This is a very difficult data to to find. Uh, how many of the workers belong really to that service or are serving two different ones? And what's very funny also in Arrange the Moon, the, there was a conflict of interest because uh, Sorea, this private operator, was also serving the, the, um, the potabilized water. So it was taking it from the river or the reservoir and selling it to Sorea also to serve it to the city. So they get, uh, yeah, they get the revenue twice, no? First for potabilize and then to serve it. So what was their interest in increasing this efficiency of the network if they get, if they get paid twice for the water that they were losing on the network, no? Yeah, more or less. And the, 
The other issue was the worker conditions. No? The workers' conditions is also something controversial in, in remunicipalizations. Uh, and it's being used also now by the, by the state to, to put more constraints to the remunicipalization processes. But in this case, uh, it was uh, quite complicated. And Arens de Moon, the, the city, said that they were uh, taking the, the, the private workers into public company, but they couldn't maintain their, their conditions because it was a, it was a public company which was already working, so uh, it made uh, very, a lot of differences between the other workers and the workers from the water company. So they said, okay, you can, uh, we can hire you, but with the same conditions as the other workers in the public company. Uh, Sorea uh, put them against this decision of the, count of the city council, and the workers decided to go into tribunals we, and, and not accepting the offer of the, of the city. And the result was that the city had to hire new workers with the difficulties that it uh, supposes for the municipalization, and the workers got fired from Sorea once the contract was expired. So uh, <laughs> this is... This is a, a key issue to make sure that the, the workers get involved in the process no? and that the company doesn't get in the middle because it's always a strategy they, they use. And as a last present, what Soria did was uh, make a mistake in the last bill. They, they uh, I think it was, they built 99 mm, cubic meters to its inhabitant. So this is... Uh, crazy, and then people had to uh, not pay or ask for the, the change of the last bill. Once the, and once the public management was finally uh, working, what they discovered was the, the real efficiency of the network, that it was not 75%, but 57%, and in three years, they could increase this efficiency to 67 67%. So, uh, also, some, some other uh, uh, funny thing that they discovered was that the outsourcing contracts for water services that Sorea was doing, uh, they found out they, couldn't, they could make it with other local companies for uh, prices four times lower than the ones Sorea was offering. No? Uh, they also could implement a, pro a progressive tariff and they take into account the number of people living in households to, to, to prepare the bills, no? to pay in, regarding the water you consume, and also the people who live in, in, in your house. Uh, this, this makes that you can provide a minimum uh, uh, water for, for each uh, inhabitant in the city. And the last uh, thing was, an uh, it was made an independent audit which uh, confirmed that there was no breach of contract in, um, regarding municip the municipality, but it, it was, there was a, a breach of the contract uh, from the company because of the efficiency fail, because they were, they were not uh, uh, maintaining the efficiency they were supposed, they were supposed to, to maintain. Arens de Moon is still working, no? Seven years later, and uh, it works. Uh, it's our one of our cases. And after that, uh, what is the what comes next here in, in Catalonia? I don't know if you were yesterday, but I think yesterday uh, Barcelona case was explained. Valladolid case was explained. That are our biggest cases in in Spain. So we have uh, 15 more cases already in process, uh, 15 cases which municipalities have approved uh, uh, in the municipal plenary um, a motion regarding to study and to implement public management in their municipalities. No? Mm, we have some municipalities from the metropolitan area of Barcelona, Barcelona, Badalona, Terrassa, and all of them, some. Uh, 2.7 million inhabitants from the 7 million inhabitants in Barcelona. So the next year I are crucial here in, in, in Catalonia uh, regarding man management of water and regarding Akbar because main, most of these cases are uh, Akbar and Suez concessions. So 
we can, we think, and we are starting uh, to feel, no, especially in Terrassa case, which is the third one, and it's the fourth city, biggest city in Catalonia, that the battle of water, the battle for water, has already started, no, Be between municipalities, citizens, and these companies. Uh, in IWES Vida, we work with uh, citizen platforms uh, which are working in, in our territory. You know, we have uh, six here, but we are hoping that more will come in the, in the next months. Especially La Taula de Terraza, the first one, it's an inspiration for all others. It's a group of citizens which have been working from 2014 for public management in Terrassa. Uh, they are self-organized, all of them, and working for public uh, management in, in their cities. We think these platforms are a key, are a key issue for these the municipalizations because what we see is that when in these processes, when citizen, citizens are involved, the transparency increases and it allows the, the participation. And this uh, can make the difference you know, in the future years because it, will pre it can prevent that a new government come and change it. No? Because as Sonia was saying at the beginning, the most easy thing now is to privatize. The difficult thing is to remunicipalize. So we need to assure that these processes are uh, stable, are endurable, and can last. And also that citizens are part of that. No? Not only municipalities need to take back the control of water and energy, but also the citizens, we need to get back to, to, to know what's happening with, with the water, no? Because uh, we are totally out of, uh, in Barcelona, we don't know where the water comes, and we almost don't know, we only remember when there is no water, no? When the dries come, the drought, but we need to start. And, okay, I will explain quickly the, the case of Terrassa because it's not already finalized, but the, the city council has already made the decision to remunicipalize. But it's very interesting because uh, it's the fourth biggest city in Catalonia, so it would be the big remunicipalization. We think uh, it's Terrassa and then comes Barcelona. Uh, and the contract was of 75 years, so it comes from the uh, Franco times. And... Uh, the issue has been in the political agenda thanks to the citizen platform, no? Taula de l'Aigua, who's been working from 2014 to, to talk about that, to say that the contract was expiring, what are we going to do? So they were explaining, and then the issue was on the political agenda, the, and the mayor was not, about, was not in, in the beginning for remunicipalization, but... Uh, um, once the, 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 the process was starting and he started talking to the company, he saw there was no more way to work with this company, no, because it, it's a bar also, and they were not providing data. They were only saying public-private par partnership is the option. Any other option, we are not in on that. So finally, the decision of the mayor was to remunicipalize. But it was because of the company's behavior. So what we have found out once the, the, the plenary has decided to remunicipalize is a lack of transparency. We, sti we still don't know how many workers does the, the company have in the, in the city. Uh, also, how many users does the service have? So it's very difficult to implement a company with that conditions. Uh, also, the judicialization of the, the decision of the city council. And also, a campaign of disaccreditation using the donations and other uh, issues, no? disaccreditating the citizens and the, and the mayor. So <clears throat> what was the answer? Uh, Terrassa, La Taula de l'Aigua, uh, called for the first citizen parliament in, in Terrassa, and this citizen parliament called to a demonstration, and also they present a, a proposal of social control in the future, man uh, in the future company, public company which is very new, and it was what Olivia was saying, no? To have a public companies, but also working with uh, citizens to, to, pre, to, to endure these, these, these companies. 
And uh, in the front of this scenario, we have the private sector with what Claire was saying, no? These cons legal constraints that come mainly from the state, no? There is this uh, alliance between the state and the private sector, and they are proposing state, uh, state regulation, no? So let's finish with the autonomy of the municipalities because they are seeing that the municipalities are, uh, are threatened. And also, the other strategy they are using is to, is, are the workers, no? They are trying to make it difficult for the public companies to uh, get the, com the, the private workers. So, uh, luckily, uh, a law that, uh, a disposition that was in the annual budget, in, the st in the, this state annual budget, was, not, was modified, but they will keep on, no? Trying to put, uh, to confront workers and municipalities, because it's one of their, uh, their tools to stop municipalizations. So for the moment, which is our response, uh, we organized this uh, demonstration in Terrassa and Valladolid follow uh, days before this, this in May. And what we are seeing in this demonstration is something um, on, on one side for us is extraordinary, no? In Catalonia, it was the first demonstration for public water management and we had 4,000 people. So for Terrassa, which is a, a city outside of Barcelona, it's a, a big, a big hit. But on the other side, it's a very funny thing because it was a demonstration to support the mayor. No, we are not used to do demonstration to support mayor's decision, and this is what we are doing now here in in Spain. No, but we think this this alliance. No, that's. That, it has, that has begun this year between civil society and municipalities. Uh, it's very important for the municipalization and for many other issues, and that we need to, to keep uh, cultivating, to keep learning how to, how to work together, no? How the municipalities need to know how to work all together, but also civil so society, cities, water operators, because it has been demonstrated to be a very effective uh, alliance, no? And for example, uh, next year in Brasilia, we have this alternative forum that it would be super interesting that this, and, and civil society will launch it in the, in the next days, and it will be super interesting that these cities, no? These rebel cities, these municipalities could join also in this alternative water forum to defend, no? Remunicipalization and many other uh, issues that will be talked there, no? And to, to, to build this, this alliance against uh, the private sector, because the private sector uh, has it very clear, no? Their objective is one, it's make profit, and they will use all the tools that they can. So we also need to, to, to have clear which is our, our purpose and to, to work towards that all together. And for last, um, from Iowa's Vida, we, we think, we defend, and we want to build this remunicipalization, this political remunicipalization that Olivier was talking, no? With working towards this social control that doesn't exist for the moment, but we want to, to, to build. We, we are seeing it, uh, how it be, uh, becomes more, more reality in Terrassa, and we think we can continue uh, working for that and transparency and participation are key issues, no? To push for that and, and make last to the municipalizations. Thank you. Okay, now it's your, it's your turn, so you can start. I will take note of who wants to speak. Sorry, my English is not really good, but I like to ask uh, all of you because in Madrid is a, uh, like the privatization of the com companies are really close to corruption system of the conservative party, no? and uh, there are uh, like the people organizers uh, can stop two really big. Uh, 
uh, climate tension in the United uh, public system and in the water. And now it's a very big operation, it's a lethal operation that uh, there are very details of, you, you know, uh, with uh, Colombia connection, with the canal of the, uh, the second canal, is the public company of, of uh, the, the water. And also, I, I don't know if uh, there are many, uh, if, if there are uh, more cities with this kind of problem between the, the privatization and corruption is, uh, is the same. And maybe it's one of the reasons that we have to, to recover our public system of water and energy. Uh, thank you. There's two quick questions. Um, I think the last speaker spoke about how difficult it is to monitor companies when they're regional. Um, what, what we found is that increasingly these companies are, are global. So in Africa and the Middle East, for example, there's a, there's a big company called Averda, uh, which is European based, that currently provides sanitation services, I think in about 40 different cities across Africa and across the Middle East. Um, and it's based somewhere in Europe, I think it might be France or Switzerland. Um, yeah, in South Africa, we've always had outsourced services, but at least then we could you know, go to the local office in the city centre and you know, kind of engage them. Now our government tell us, well, you don't just talk to them, you've got to go and talk to these multinational companies based elsewhere in the world. And that has had a very direct impact on accountability. So just to get a sense of whether that's a similar challenge you guys are facing and how you're facing it. And then lastly, um, the again going back to energy, democratizing energy um, and looking at global solutions. Uh, South Africa, where I'm from, has some of the, probably the biggest potential for solar and wind energy in the world. Uh, but our government is currently negotiating um, with the French government, with the Russian government, and many other governments for a massive nuclear energy bill. I think they want to build about eight new nuclear power stations. Um, and significant evidence over the last couple years of corruption and bribery. Particularly from the Russian government, um, I'm not sure the extent to which there's scrutiny of the French government and the Americans. Um, but again, just from an international perspective, I think it's important that we, we're talking about supporting the municipalization of the services. Um, we look at the impact some of these affluent governments are having on doing the opposite in many countries in the global south. Uh, thanks. My name is James. Uh, I've got a question, I guess it's in Latin, but I don't think it works in Chile. So I'm part of the campaign school who switched on to London, which is campaigning around municipal energy um, in London. And our campaign is mainly focused around municipal energy with activities in um, the generation sector and the supply, so in, in buying energy as a household. Um, but like you, we do that at the grid, buying back grid. My question for you is just, firstly, are you aware of, of cases where that's happened beyond the obvious, the handover of Berlin and the cases that people talk about? And then secondly, what, what for you are the, what makes the grid so strategic for, for taking back the municipality? Why is that key for that strategy? Yeah, I, I know that I think Hamburg had to buy its grid back, and that was quite expensive. And I'm just wondering to get a sense of how many of what we've talked about just come back for free because the concession ends, or how much money you have to pay the private sector, how that's paid for, uh, in terms of does it go on municipal borrowing and figures. And, and then how much comes back in over there. I am acting from Turkey, I come from Istanbul. And uh, we have this municipality, 
which is completely municipalized, but uh, when they sell water to us, it's very, it's getting every day, not every day maybe, but every year, every month sometimes, it's getting more and more expensive. And the quality of water is not uh, good because we cannot even drink this water. So the municipality is already passing his job to provide drinking water to citizens to the bottled water industry. And uh, when we look at it on papers, it's a municipalization of, uh, I mean, we don't have any uh, privatization problem or anything, but the, pri uh, the municipal companies are working like, you know, companies, just like profit-driven companies. For example, in the middle of Istanbul, there is just one forest left that we have, and that forest has a water resource. The municipal uh, company is taking water from here, extracting it, and selling it to 40 different countries. This is a this is not a private company, but a, but a municipal company. What do you suggest? I mean, how should we make people be aware of the problem in a country like Turkey that remunicipalization is not sometimes the key? You know, you have to involve more people, like you guys were saying, uh, public participation, involving more citizens, and so on. But there is no demand for this in my country. How can you, what do you think that we can do? I'm, I'm really asking this question from the heart. I wonder your answer. Okay, so we ask and we go back again. So I can answer the, the question which are more directly on the grid. So um, actually, you don't specifically need to, uh, for example, in France, the grid is the pro property of the local authority. They only uh, give in concession the management of it. But most of the public, uh, of the municipality, they don't even know that they are the, the owners. Sometimes they, it, it even happened that the concession uh, manager wanted to sell the grid back to the municipality when the municipality was actually already the landlord. So it's like a, a little bit like your example, when you find a way to, 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 to sell something which is not yours. But um, uh, so what is super important, uh, there is those emblematic examples of Hamburg and, and Berlin, and Berlin it's only the start in Hamburg. It cost two billion to buy the grid back, and uh, they managed to lever uh, energy uh, citizen, no, cit citizen um, savings by only 35 million. So all the rest is a public uh, uh, risk in a way. It's the municipality who's taking the risk. It's, it's, it's not necessarily needed that to ha you have it, but once you have it, for example, they already have uh, quite a large benefit on the, the transaction costs that the grid, uh, when, you don't, when you have to um, make it operated by somebody else, and it, it does cost, so by, I think it's by year, the city of Hamburg, for example, savings on the grid operation and transmission cost, it's uh, 60 million. So of course 60 million and 2 billion is not the same thing, but it's not, I mean, there, there is still, a, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very large amount of money, but still maybe it makes sense economically speaking, as far as you can look at very long term. Otherwise, the important thing, it was very well explained by, the, by your example on, on Terrasa, is what you need is the data. You need the transparency, you need to make sure that when they tell you that it's efficiency of 75%, it's 75% and it's not 57 and so on and so on, not just by, by a trick of figures. And, uh, so the, the, this is more about the, the real control and making sure that you in, you, in your negotiation contract, that you have the access to everything you need, so the data, that you have access to the decision on the infrastructure. Um, so, and this is where actually the problem is that then the private companies, company is not interested anymore because if they don't have the kind of a key on the infrastructure then, uh, decision, then they cannot uh, really decide on, uh, on, on what to, to do. And maybe on the, on the South African uh, question on nuclear plant, which is more linked also to uh, energy. Well, you, you, don't, you don't need to believe that it's only like in Africa that we do that because we also are trying to sell the same in UK and uh, with uh, great success actually, <laughs> with uh, Chinese uh, ex um, investors into uh, French technology that is completely dead, but uh, okay. We, we, we need still to, but it's, it's, it's uh, this, the nuclear power plant, I think it's something which is quite dead and 
it's very interesting because in France the, the debate moved that there is a kind of, a, okay, we know that we are in a dying mode and we need to find a way to phase it out and phase it out, these kind of things, it's like can take decades. Um, but it's still, in, in, it's, it's still also very much based on um, psychology. I think in everything we always undermine the psychology. Like, for example, the nuclear power uh, electricity that is produced in France it's considered as uh, local production because the nuclear power plant, nuclear in, in, in our national statistics, it's, it's be, uh, considered as own resources when, of course, uranium is not coming from France. And it's not that we have half of Africa that is French. I mean, it's not uh, even if we want to, to believe so. So it's, um, it, it's the, this is a kind of psychology that you, we need to also really look on and, and work on to what is local and what is your, um, your competitive advantage in a way. I will just stop there. And maybe just on, on the uh, corruption, because your example is that to say that actually municipal is not better than, pri than private, and actually it's true. In Belgium there is currently a big, big scandal, which is not corruption, but it's, it's advantages of uh, what we call um, initiated, co uh, well, when people have advantages that they should, and they use it, basically, and it's on municipal energy companies, the ones that are actually uh, uh, managing the grids in, uh, in different uh, countries and in different uh, cities in Belgium. So it's true that what is important is in the transparency, whether it is municipal or whether it is private. I've been long. Um. Uh, yeah, to continue on that subject, of, of course, uh, there are many public companies, uh, especially when they're uh, corporatized uh, public companies that are not from directly managed by the, the municipality, but by uh, other companies that's 100 percent owned public that have uh, many of the same issues as private companies. And I think uh, to, uh, to answer a bit your question on Turkey, uh, what the remunicipalization movement shows is that uh, uh, I think Remunicipalization is generally a reaction against this sort of thing in the private sector, but it shows that you know you can reform uh, public uh, services without having to privatize, mm -hmm. because the argument that uh, all those financial international financial institutions, the private companies, say is that you know uh, all those public companies are not efficient, uh, there's corruption, so you need to bring in a private uh, company to sort it out and clear it out, and it's all going to get better. But what the remunicipalization movement shows is that it's not working. It's not solving the the structural problems of public services and there are other options to reform public services and one of them in, in Norway the example I showed is working closely with unions because they know how the services run uh, and of course the and the key way is of course uh, democratization transparency etc and maybe to answer your question on Turkey another thing that's really strong in the water sector is uh, what we call public public partnerships so you have uh, an, an efficient, uh, you know, well-established public company like Eau de Paris that has partnerships uh, with uh, other public operators in Europe or in the global south to help them, you know, uh, improve their, you know, the way they operate and improve their performance, etc. And that's the purpose. And they're not for not for profit partnerships. They're not. Uh, so that, that's a good alternative to, uh, to privatization of public private partnerships. Um, so on the question of how much money a municipalization costs, we find that it does cost money, even uh, it, when uh, contracts expire, con and uh, it's, it's often it still involves a some form of, co of compensation to the company for uh, some investments or the equipment, etc. And it, and it's always the question is about how much money, and that's where the, all the negotiation and the threats of ISDS and all those things come in. I've seen. Here in Barcelona, Akbar, uh, I've seen numbers increasing every week, and it was 1 billion, now it's 1.5 billion, and it's going to continue increasing too. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, uh, and in that we have some examples like in Berlin, where they had to buy, buy, buy back all the shares of the private companies. It was really expensive. It's really going to hinder uh, the long-term running of the public service. But in most cases, it's uh, still uh, worthwhile for public companies to remunicipalize because even in the middle term and sometimes in the very short term because they, there's so much savings uh, just by the fact of not having them uh, outsourced and uh, uh, you know there are some examples in France for instance when Paris remunicipalized they saved 40 million just 
because they didn't have a, you know, dividends going somewhere. And in the UK, just by having not to pay a billions, millions of, year, of pounds to a PwC or something just for designing the contract or having a lot of lawyers, it saved also bil millions of your pounds. Um, and what, yeah, the question on the accountability of uh, multinational companies, of course, well, that's what privatization is all about. It's uh, convincing local authorities that, you know, they don't need to be responsible for public services and uh, somebody else is going to take care of it. As a, and uh, when the citizens are going to go there uh, to complain about something, they're going to say, go and see the company. And that's what they're trying to sell. But, and, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in this context, it's uh, heartening to see uh, so many local authorities are actually willing to take back on all those public services because taking back public services means taking back some serious issues of, you know, like, you know, providing clean water and energy to everybody, etc. So, yeah. uh, regarding corruption, uh, here in Spain, we have uh, another big case, no, related to private company, which is El Caso Pokémon. I don't know, yeah, this is, yeah, a very big case in Asturias, Galicia. Now it's been, uh, uh, in, it's been uh, ampliada, well, ampliada the, the investigation to the south of Spain, and uh, it's been also uh, related to to Akbar in Catalonia. Mm, it's uh, actually the company is Akbar, but in, in Galicia. So we have, I think we have many cases of corruption, and that's one of the lines that we want to, to explore and also explain the corruption in Canal Isabel II because the, in that case it's not related strictly into the public company, but it started uh, when it was not privatized, but it started working as a as a private, no, as as it, the the. Yeah. the the, the women from Turkey was saying, no, these public companies that behave as private companies uh, are different than the ones. And we also need to differentiate, no? The, I was in Italy yesterday and they have this, this problem, no? They have public companies in a lot of cases, but they behave as, public, as, as private. And to explain that to the, to the people, to the population who have uh, had a referendum back in 2011 saying yes to public management, but it's very difficult for them to explain to the population that they have public management, but they behave as private, and it's uh, it's tricky, and we need to we need to work on that. And uh, how to raise awareness in in Turkey about that? No, I would say the same as Claire. Transparency is the the first step. No, to to have data and to be able to share it with everyone in a in a easy and friendly way to 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 raise awareness and then it's also very useful to to find uh, investigate a little bit and find and propose some little actions that people can do easily you know and then if you give the tools and you give the information and you give the tools something can happen no in the end that's what we are. That's what we are planning to keep on doing here. So, there are five people more that want to speak. If you are um, not, if you don't talk too long, maybe there will be time to answer. But I'm not really sure. If you <laughs> <laughs> the option to speak, and we'll see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. talk a lot about um, remunicipalization, the local context, 
And I'm really interested, I mean, I work in Brussels to see what are the barriers from the EU level, what have been, uh, what have you come across in energy, uh, in water as well, um, whether this has been something that has been uh, on the agenda. And maybe if you have any examples from waste as well, are there sort of EU barriers, we're talking about the energy electricity market, um, and what are the ways around them, what have you seen, you know, ways, uh, and municipalization of getting around these barriers. Uh, and then just quickly, I was just going to mention, I was recently in the Balkans, which is not yet privatised many of the public services in terms of water and energy, um, but how to avoid privatisation was about a different democratic model. Dem democratising an already public service is a key thing, rather than having to wait 20 years until it's been privatised and then taking it back in, um, which I think might have to happen in Poland. Um, but this is a, their big focus is on better public management. Uh, it's one of the key things. Um, so, Alexandra Popatan from the University of Girona, thank you for the informing presentations. All of your questions for Miriam, um, quickly. So, the battle against big companies in energy seems to be uh, more elaborate in, in, in terms of the kind of model they defend, for example. So, there is a lot of discussion on cooperatives, decentralization. While in water, it seems to me, at least in Catalonia, the case that I know better, uh, at least now, I know you are really at the beginning, uh, there is more talk on tariffs, corruption, etc. But I was wondering uh, if in these discussions, for example, in Terrassa, which you, I'm sure you, you know well, do they talk, is, is there a talk on the kind of model you are defending after the, so the, the remunicipalization? So the question would be remunicipalization for what? What kind of city, what kind of model of water management? Is it decentralized or is it to keep change a bit to keep everything the same. Hopefully not. So I'm just, that would be the question. Thank you. Yes, sorry.
part of the housing stock has been privatized, like filled in like budget holes. And now we have the situation that the city wants to like reusualize, but it has to buy back for like really, really high prices, like once it's sold like very cheaply, like 20 years ago, so years ago. Like one example, like recently block was reborn by a public company. Examples from Eastern Europe, actually there is very few, but there is also some. Like in Poland, for example, there is a number of uh, small, but these are small municipalities that are in the coal regions, where some of the mayors, they're starting to do cooperatives of energy. So it's not public company, but because they want to start uh, moving, it's a coal, uh, very dependent coal region near to Katowice, and what they want is to actually to change the mindset by having windmills that are giving a return back on the territory, saying there is an alternative after coal for the territory. So this is one example, and otherwise we, in Czech Republic there is few um, uh, c uh, cities that are also very advanced where they still have municipal companies actually, where they, they have not sold it, and it's mainly district eating. And one uh, in Romania also there is some. So when you still have your district eating company, then you can start making it doing some renewable com uh, energy, so it, it, it exists. And for the, um, for the barriers at each EU level, maybe we can speak after also, because it's, but it's mainly about uh, the way it is designed. Still, the EU is only considering electricity by dif uh, energy by different sectors. So you have the electricity, you have the gas, you have the petrol, you have the nuclear, and uh, it, today it's completely obsolete. This, this vision. And then the other vision which is they have is that they also still believe about uh, national systems and interconnection between countries. So the, the way the energy system is uh, envisaged at EU level is that you, uh, energy uh, cooperatives in, in um, Germany will, will create a lot of energy, will do a lot of energy production with very huge offshore windmills and that when there is big uh, electricity produced, it goes to Norway, and in Norway we put it back into what they, we call the reservoir, so we, 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 we make water going back into the mountain, and then we store energy there, and then when we need energy on the continent, we take the water off the mountain in Norway, and it goes to Spain. So it's, that, that's, that's the, the problem we have for the moment. So it's more a mind problem. But there is interesting proposals in, on to introduce community energy articles in the renewable directive that is currently under view and in the market design directive. So there is views, but it, it's still, a, it's more a mindset problem. I would stop there, because it's already long. Um, yeah, too, so we haven't gone through them, uh, but we have examples uh, of remunicipalization in Eastern Europe. Uh, the reason I think there's the most, uh, the two reasons why there are most examples are in Western Europe. One is uh, 
we have a longer history of privatization. It takes a bit of time to make contracts expire and then and second, uh, com maybe not, com I mean, probably compared to Eastern Europe and the rest of the world, local authorities have more power in Europe and North, North America than in Africa or Latin America. I think that's the, the reason we see this big block of uh, municipalization in Europe. But we have examples in, uh, in a few countries in Eastern Europe. And I think one of uh, the ones we highlight in, uh, in our book and our reports that's going to be released at the end of the month, and it's very important, uh, uh, is uh, Vilnius in uh, Lithuania because they have uh, moved to remunicipalize the district heating, which was outsourced to uh, Veolia, French company. And uh, Veolia came back with a big ISDS claim of uh, several million, hundred millions of uh, euros. And I think I really see it as a warning, <laughs> this ISDS claim, which is really big for what it was. I really see it as a warning to the rest of Eastern Europe, saying, you know, as a way to say, uh, you know, if you begin to seek to remunicipalize, uh, that's what you're getting into. And I think, uh, I mean, that's my analysis, but I'm pretty confident in it. And, but there are other, and we see there's a level of, I mean, it's a question of uh, the bargaining powers and negotiating power of, of countries. And for instance, in Bulgaria, there's been a movement a bit like in Western Europe countries to have a referendum to remunicipalize the water company in Sofia. But there was a huge, uh, in the design of the contracts and then threats to the, the, the politicians that make, made it not happen. So it's really a, in Western Europe, we still have a bit more power than in Eastern Europe on those uh, issues. Uh, social care, uh, all the examples I mentioned in Norway are mostly in, uh, in the field of social care. I think uh, it's in different countries you see privatization is targeted, there's more uh, targeted certain sectors, like in France we have this huge history of whatever privatization, etc. In Norway, it's more local government and social care and healthcare, and uh, all this, those examples are social care, so I think that's interesting. I think Barcelona, they're also doing quite a bit in terms of remunicipalizing some uh, social care uh, uh, services. And uh, barriers at EU level, uh, well, I think there's a general problem that uh, EU regulations are designed for big companies and not for local authorities. <laughs> we have. And uh, it's uh, just... Uh, it's not so much that the EU is actively, is actively preventing remunicipalization, it's just designing uh, the whole system uh, without thinking that it could be anything as public service. <laughs> and then you can look into different uh, regulations and there are practical hindrances, but it's just the general mindset that you know, the normal way to operate is to have those big oli ol oligopolies, like Claire said, six companies running its services, in telecoms, water, etc. and that's the perfect way to go. It's just the way it works. So, uh, Alexandra, uh, regarding the RASA model, <coughs> the, La Taula propo proposed a, a model uh, into the, in February in the Citizen Parliament, and it was approved in the Citizen Parliament, and it's, pro it's been proposed to the City Council. Also, the City Council is, a st is a studying their own model with participation let's not say social control, because we don't know, but the one from Terrassa, it proposes a city council of water, no, formed by uh, citizens, uh, which, can, which can make uh, like a, an, observ an observation and control of the, of the company from the outside and from the inside. No? So they plan to have someone uh, into the uh, management system, I think, and uh, but also the most important part is the observatory from the cities, no? this city council formed by uh, many entities and organizations from the city uh, from the outside no? to keep uh, increasing this transparency, this awareness no? and participating. So yeah, the idea is not to keep the same, but to tackle these problems, not, on lo not only profit, which is one of the main issues, but also corruption. And also uh, what we say from IWAS Vida is that the municipalization also needs to, to as in, in, in energy, you, you want to localize the decisions also from the city councils to take decisions uh, regarding water uh, planning, which are decisions that now are not taken from the city councils. And uh, regarding the threats at the EU level, no, I think uh, yeah, Olivia explained <laughs> very well that there is this um, lack of 
uh, thinking about the municipalization, but I think um, the cities also have this reto, uh, um, challenge, challenge, no? Yeah. To start organizing and to be able to confront the private lobby, no? Because uh, we've been doing it from civil society for so long, but now we need the cities to get involved also in the in the statements of the EU, that the EU, the, the, the Commission provides for cities, no, that they already exist. So uh, the cities that are for remunicipalization needs to get into there and start changing the policies and doing proposals from there. I hope in coordination with civil society who's been doing that for so long. No. If I can just add one thing on the EU level. My impression when I look at the water municipalization, especially in France, is that there's a lot of uh, ignorance and falsehoods uh, circulated among local authorities. Many local authorities think, oh, we cannot do that because of EU level, which is not true. And I don't know if it's because of ignorance or because the private companies tell them uh, they cannot do that, which is very possible, or because uh, the French state administration, has, I mean, there's a lot of ignorance on that level that so uh, there's an imagination that EU prevents things from happening that is, uh, you know, not a, a, a totally true. Okay. And, well, yeah. I don't know if it's not, we've got one minute. Uh, so, if, okay, but you will have no answer at least not from the table. <laughs> <laughs> That's when, what I was going to say is that uh, thanks to you three, Miriam, Claire, and Olivia to come and then and thanks to you all because you've got now homework. It's sharing the knowledge we've received and multiplicating the experience now that we are more connected and we can keep connecting now at the cockpit. So Super. we can maybe take these answers, these questions there. Thank you very much. Thank you.